Bible this morning, if you will, turn with me to the book of 1 Peter, chapter number 1. 1 Peter, chapter number 1. And once you've found that, just hold your finger there, because we're going to be looking at a couple of passages uh, I want us to consider. Now, I don't know, how many uh, watched the hockey game last night? Some of you did. Yeah, some of you didn't. I mean, the, the Toronto Maple Leafs were playing. They have not gone from this realm to the next realm in 19 years. And so uh, the game went into overtime, and it was 1-1. And finally, uh, for the first time in 19 years, the Toronto Maple Leafs went to the level two. And uh, so it was a moment that was unspeakable. Oh, my goodness. Are they going to win? Are they going to score? Are they going to be back to now 20 years since they got there? I mean, hockey is kind of based around Canada, right? And so we kind of expect that the, the Leafs would uh, at least be able to score. And they did. And so it was kind of an unspeakable moment. And so I want to speak to you this morning on that whole aspect of unspeakable. So as we consider this text from 1 Peter, I'd like you to hold your finger there. Go to 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. 2 Corinthians 9, 15, and then we'll be looking at 2 Corinthians 12, 4. I'll invite you to stand with me as we read from God's word this morning. We'll begin reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Then back over to 2 Corinthians 9, 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And then to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 4. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we can spend together this morning. We're thankful for each one that came to church, that chose to be here this morning on purpose. And I pray that you'll just bless in a very special way today. I ask that the power of the Holy Spirit would anoint me afresh and anew this morning and that we would have spirit-filled listening. Father, we desire your presence here with us today. And before we leave this place, I pray that we'll be able to walk out those doors today and know that we have met with you. I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will work through this building as we consider the power of your word as it applies to us even today in 2023. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Back in Easter time, uh, there was a man who willingly uh, laid down on a wooden cross and had someone nail him to that cross, thinking that would be you know, uh, a way of uh, uh, getting closer to God, a way that would be pleasing to God. Uh, misinformed, he suffered brutally. Many years ago, I was driving home uh, from work. I had four of my employees with me, and as we were traveling along, we came across a car accident. And in uh, slowing down and getting out to see what had happened, there was a head-on collision. We checked, and there was a lady that was uh, badly injured but stable. And uh, then the next car we checked, there was, I think she might have been 20, 21, 22. The man that was driving the other car in his mid-30s was in terrible shape, and uh, he was very, very badly uh, injured, and the steering wheel had crushed his chest. And so we were able, to, with the men that were working for me, peel the steering wheel away. And uh, underneath his car, a fire erupted, and so it became necessary to move him out of the car. We uh, cut the uh, seat belt off, and uh, we pulled him out of the car. It was obvious he had a broken neck, and I felt there was a very weak pulse. And just in a few minutes, uh, another vehicle stopped, and then he said, oh, I know first aid. And so he began working on that man, giving him mouth-to-mouth uh, resuscitation. But in the next few moments, we saw that man pass from this life to the next life as he breathed his last breath and died. My men were speechless. It was an unspeakable moment. My wife and I were traveling from uh, Western Canada here just a few years ago, and we were traveling Highway 69, kind of a treacherous highway at night. It's very dark, a lot of rock. And as we were traveling, it was pouring rain. It was 11 o'clock at night, very dark. And uh, 
uh, I, I had a car coming towards me, and it swerved in front of me, and just at the last moment, pulled back into their own lane, and I looked in my rearview mirror, and I saw the car go up over an embankment, across a uh, barrier, and down into the ditch. And so I pulled over right away, and I said to my wife, we need to check what happened. So I backed up and uh, went down. The car was, uh, the tires were still, still spinning, and uh, it was completely upside down on its roof. And uh, I used my flash, my flashlight on my cell phone to look around, and uh, there was three girls scrambling out of the broken windows at the back of the car, and a 60-year-old lady that was a driver was trying to crawl through a broken window. And as I walked around the car to see them, I saw a hand sticking out from underneath the car. I uh, immediately went down and checked. There was no pulse. I uh, crawled under the car. There was about a 12-inch space between the rocks and the roof of the car. And I felt around to see if I could find a body. And I felt a leg, and there was no pulse. That individual, just a 16-year-old girl, had already expired and gone from this life to the next. When the girls, we got them together, and we put them in a vehicle, and the lady that was the driver came and sat in our vehicle, um, it was an unspeakable moment. Nobody wanted to say anything. And then as the, uh, we made the 911 call and people came, um, everyone was speechless. One man said to me, we need to lift the car off that girl. I said, neighbor, it's too late. I'm sorry, but uh, uh, she is already expired. So we were speechless because of the situation that had happened. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I was watching uh, some horse racing um, just on television, and uh, it was a, you know, uh, a grand title uh, match, and there was a, a big prize at the end, and as the horse was racing around the track, all of a sudden the lead horse blew a knee out, and uh, the, the whole leg went out from underneath him and did a spill, and the, <laughs> the rider went sideways. The horse was permanently injured. They euthanized him there in front of thousands of people, and you could have heard a bin drop. It was speechless to, to just consider that. I know my son Steve said to me, uh, He'd just come back from training camp, and they were doing outdoor training when he was in uh, 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 cadets, and he, uh, he had been with, I think, four other guys in his tent during a lightning storm. One of the men was leaning up against the uh, metal pole in the tent when lightning struck it, and uh, he was taken to the hospital with injuries. He survived, but everybody was speechless when it happened and huddled down on the floor thinking it might strike twice. It was an unspeakable moment. I recall um, being in practice uh, in Colorado uh, running some horses. I was training six horses down on a, a ranch in a box in Canyon getting ready for one of my rides when uh, I had an accident with my horse, ripped the kneecap off my knee, and uh, it was an unspeakable moment. But here in our text, we have the word unspeakable spoken three times. Only three times in the Bible, actually, do we have that word, unspeakable. Have you ever seen a beautiful scenery and then tried to describe it to somebody else? And it just seems you can't formulate it into words. Well, now we have cell phones, we can take a picture. But when you try to describe it, there just isn't the right words to make it work. Have you ever left the service here on a Sunday and you knew that the power of God was working and people's hearts were being touched? And, and, and then the next day you go to work or you go home to tell your family and you just couldn't quite get the words to explain what had happened or, or how, you know, what was taking place. Uh, maybe you said, boy, howdy. Well, that's not actually uh, in your King James Bible, that word. Um, you have to go way back into the Greek to find it. But anyways, maybe you said, boy, howdy. You know, you wouldn't believe what happened at our church, and you're so excited, and yet maybe the person you're talking to said, huh? And they just didn't get it. Why? They hadn't been there. And, and you couldn't relate to them the, the wonderment that took place during that service. You just couldn't convey it to them. The words didn't, wouldn't come. You know, um, maybe a man or a young man sees a, a beautiful young lady and, and tried to describe her to somebody, and it just doesn't make any sense. It can't get the words. I had that same experience. I was, well, three years old. My wife would won. I met her for the first time in the nursery of a Baptist church. I think it was an unspeakable moment. Um, anyways, uh, I met her later on when she was 14 and uh, much prettier than when she was one. And uh, then we got married just a little later than that. Well, quite a bit later than that, 1975. But it was an unspeakable moment there as well as we stood before the preacher. A very solemn occasion, but a joyful uh, uh, time. 
Maybe you've been there where there's something happened in your life and it was so intent, so uh, 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 you know, vibrant, but you just couldn't put it into words. Maybe as we consider 1 Corinthians 2, 9, we consider that word unspeakable. That word unspeakable, go there again. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man those things which God has prepared for them that love him. We can't quite comprehend all that God has done. Um, that's what the word unspeakable means, by the way. Um, there's no way to convey it, no way to describe it. It means that things that are beyond description in verbal text. Three times this word is used in the Bible. Two times in 2 Corinthians and once in 1 Peter. And as we consider uh, 2 Corinthians 9.15, what is the Apostle Paul saying? He's speaking of an unspeakable gift. What gift? Well, the gift of salvation. Uh, the gift of eternal life in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, you could recite that. You probably heard it since you were in Sunday school. Maybe your mom and dad taught you that verse as a child growing up. And maybe we got so familiar with it, we forgot to realize what an incredible gift that is God has given to us. It's an unspeakable gift. God gave his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come, be born, take on the form of a human being, and die on the cross for our sins. That's an unspeakable gift that God has given to us that we might attain eternal life through him. If we look at uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verse 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. If it's a gift of salvation, then how good is salvation? How good is that unspeakable gift? I can tell you this, it's unspeakably good. How good is it to have your sins forgiven? Unspeakably good. How good is it to have uh, your name written down in heaven that you know that you're going to go to heaven? It's unspeakably good. You listen to what Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Go there. Luke 10, 20. Notwithstanding... In this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, the word rejoice means to, uh, it's not just the same as happy, or I'm so glad my name's written in heaven. To rejoice, the word rejoice means to jump up and down, be excited, uh, click your heels together and clap your hands together and shout about it because it is an exciting rejoicing moment to realize your name's written down in heaven. You feel about that way this morning? About the salvation God has given to you? Well, praise the Lord. My name is written in heaven. And I pray that yours is too. That's what it's all about. How good is it? Unspeakably good. How good is it to have God as your father? It's unspeakably good. How good is it to have Jesus Christ, the hope of all glory, in us, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God? It's unspeakably good. How good is it to have the Holy Ghost as our energy? How good is it to have the Holy Ghost as our comforter when things go wrong and things go sideways? How good is it to have the Holy Ghost to be our teacher to expound upon the Word of God as we read it? How good is it to have the Holy Ghost as our power? It's unspeakably good. That's how good it is. How good is it to know if Jesus came today, we would rise up in the clouds to meet him together? I can tell you this, that's unspeakably good. How good is it to know if I should drop dead behind this pulpit this morning? Now, don't say amen. <laughs> but, but if I did, how good is it to know that I would immediately be in heaven? Unspeakably good. And how about you? Should you be going home today and all of a sudden your heart begins to tremble and you have a heart attack and just in a moment are transported from this world to the next and to know that your home is in heaven, it's unspeakably good. The Apostle Paul 
said this, thanks be unto God for salvation. A gift of God that is so wonderful that it's beyond speech. It's beyond what we could uh, explain to somebody else. It's beyond our vocabulary. It, consider this, the Greek words that make up unspeakable uh, in all three of these times that it's used in the Bible are just slightly different in each aspect. Three times a word is mentioned in English, unspeakable. But the meanings are, well, just slightly different. For example, in the verse concerning the gift of salvation, the word unspeakable means no sound. There's no sound that could communicate how good it is to be saved. It's unspeakably good. There's no sound to communicate that. Um, the Greek word is uh, a, which is a. That means no. And euphonia, which means uh, phono, which means sound. That's where we get our word phonograph. Uh, most of you don't even know what a phonograph is unless you're over 50 years old. <laughs> but that's where uh, our original sound, well, you got a, a, a plastic tape recorder disc, or a plastic disc that we used to use. Actually, before that, when I was a child, we had a phonograph that you, you uh, cranked it, and there was a spring in there. You cranked it enough, and then all of a sudden, it would play music back to you. How many remember those? Well, both of you. <laughs> There's a few people as old as me. Uh, and, and today, of course, we have, well, cell phones and many other mm, ways that we can listen and enjoy that kind of thing. But when it comes to salvation, there is no sound. There's nothing that can communicate how good it is. That word, uh, aphono, means unsoundable. There's just no word, no sound. You could cheer, yay, I'm saved. You could write uh, uh, something out and have a banner portrayed off the back of your truck or your car. It still wouldn't make it as explicit, as incredible how good it is to be saved. You could cheer, yay, I'm saved. Go down to Maple Leaf Stadium or wherever they play hockey these days and uh, get out on the ice and, and tell people I'm saved. But you still cannot communicate how incredibly good it is to have your sins forgiven and a home in heaven. It doesn't describe how good it is to be saved. Uh, you clap your hands and praise God and say, Lord, I'm saved. That doesn't do it. You can't communicate it. It's unsoundable. It's such a joy to know you're saved. It's unspeakably good. Secondly, uh, notice what it says in 1 Peter 1.8. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom... Though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with what? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know, this is the second time we see the word unspeakable in the Bible where it's used. And here it concerns um, joy. The first time, it, you know, is salvation. And here is the word unspeakable referring to joy. Now, question, are you joyful this morning? No, I don't just mean, oh, I'm happy. No, I mean joyful this morning. You see, happiness can tarnish if things go sideways on you. If something goes wrong, you look after service and, oh my goodness, you got a flat tire. And it might dispel the happiness that you were experiencing. But it cannot diminish joy. Joy comes from within. Joy is something we possess because God has given us joy knowing our sins are forgiven. You know, other things are peripheral. But there's a joy in knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior. And the Bible says, joy unspeakable and full of glory. We sing that, so, that song. Uh, I think it's 288 in our hymn book, joy unspeakable. And when it's used here, it's not the same word um, as we heard the first time, not alfono, but this word means there's no word possible to describe it. In other words, there's no sound. And there are no words to describe joy unspeakable. There are no sounds to describe salvation and there are no words to describe the joy that God gives to a Christian because their sins have been forgiven. And by the way, that verse was written by Peter in a time when there is like incredible, terrible trials going on. You know, this week you may have seen, um, uh, you know, pictures or video of uh, atrocities going on in Sudan. Uh, well, war is broken out down there, and there's many atrocities happening, and some of them are unspeakable. We can't even fathom them. Um, we consider, you know, going way back, and most of you would remember 9-11. You know, it was unspeakable when the Twin Towers fell. I remember watching it on television in shock. 
my son Steve and I were traveling to Western Canada. I know where I was when that happened. You probably do too. Why? It was an unspeakable moment. You know, we're going through turbulence, a little flux and change in our world today. Things aren't the same as they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, it doesn't mean that God has abandoned us, but things are certainly different, aren't they? Our liberties and freedoms are starting to change. But amidst all of that, we can still rise up above that as the peripheral things of this world and still have joy unspeakable and full of glory because of what God has done for us. We have unspeakable joy. I wish uh, when we witness, we could just see the Christian life as not a life of drudgery, uh, a, a life of boredom with all the fun taken out of life, but a life of joy, a life of peace, a life of contentment. With those, by the way, those three elements are what the world is striving for today. Multimillionaires would give all that they possess to obtain those things, and yet you have it by simply trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Here is, uh, we see it a third time um, in 2 Corinthians 12, 4. Notice what it says. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. Thou that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words were not lawful for man to utter. Paul is caught up to the third heaven here. He saw heaven where all our Born again, loved ones are today. Those that have trusted Christ as Savior. Paul came to a point where he saw those that he were familiar with that had already passed on from this life to the next that were saved. And Paul came back, and someone may have asked him, hey, what was it like? What did you see, Paul? <laughs> and Paul likely would have said, well, you know, I've been to heaven but he couldn't describe it. It was unspeakable. I can't tell you what I saw. How beautiful heaven, we sing that song, how beautiful heaven must be. But that doesn't convey how beautiful heaven is. It's unspeakably beautiful, unspeakably incredible. And we have an unspeakable joy because we know our home is there. How good is it to be saved? It's unspeakably good. What kind of joy do we have as Christians? It's unspeakably good. We have an unspeakable joy. We have an unspeakable salvation. And we have an unspeakable future in a place called heaven. The word unspeakable that is used concerning heaven in the Greek is um, the same English word, but slightly different in the Greek. Uh, it is um, uh, a combination of the two, if you please. So I think if you follow me for just a second, you might learn something here about what the Apostle Paul is trying to describe regarding salvation, regarding joy, and then, of course, uh, heaven as well. The word uh, in salvation was athonos. No sound could describe how unspeakably good God is. No sound could declare the glory of salvation. He came down uh, to joy and used the words no words could describe. It was un unspeakable and no sound and no words could describe how incredible it is regarding salvation and regarding joy. The words that are used in 2 Corinthians 12, 4 concerning heaven are a uh, reto, where we get our word rhetoric. Uh, in other words, there are no sounds, no words to describe it. Um, the verse is saying that there is no way that you can speak aloud. Uh, you get no words or sound to describe heaven. It's beyond our comprehension, and we can't even tell you how incredible it is. We know it's wonderful, but we don't have the vocabulary to describe how wonderful. So here's the message. If salvation and joy of the Lord and the glories of heaven that we are looking forward to are unspeakable, that means we cannot speak it. All we can do is show it. There are some things that are too good to explain with words. What are they? Well, they're unspeakable. We can't even comprehend it. Ah, it's kind of like uh, the uh, pecan mudslide at Dairy Queen. But uh, way, way above that, the greatest thing you can ever imagine is heaven itself. 
and access to heaven through Jesus Christ. Those things are unspeakably good. God was saying, when it comes to salvation, it takes more than just words, more than just speaking about it. You'll have to show it. You'll have to live it. When it comes to joy, you'll have to do more than just talk about it. You, you have to show it, and you have to live it. Um, heaven takes more than a description that we could come up with. You'll have to show people what heaven is like by the life that you live now on earth. And if you walk around with a long jaw and, and, a, and a sad countenance everywhere you go, you're not showing what the joy of heaven is all about. You're not showing what the joy of the Christian life is all about. There was a man who uh, was an infidel one time, and he, he said, I have explained away God. I have explained away Christ, and I have explained away uh, heaven. But there is one thing I cannot explain away. That is the faith of my mother. You see, faith is something that you can see. Faith is something we can act out our faith in God. Uh, you know, there's been many a wife that looked at her husband who got saved and trusted Christ because the change that took place in his life now affected her. And vice versa. Many a husband has been saved by the change that took place in his wife. A complete transformation. What was that? Being born again. A new creature on the inside. We still look the same on the outside. But on the inside, it's a brand new life. I, I get a little concerned when I hear of someone who comes to church and lives one way on Sunday, but then on Monday through Saturday, they're completely different people. They don't live what they preach. They don't live what they have heard. They don't live what they are supposed to live, and that is to show what the Christian life is all about, because the world around us is watching, trust me. We need to live all week what we profess on Sunday when we come to church. We need to live all week what the preacher preaches on Sunday. Well, you say, I just don't agree with the preacher. That's okay. You've been wrong before. You'll get over it. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we have a responsibility. If we want to reach the lost today, some of the methods we used in the past where people would clamor to come to church. If we had a Sunday like this 40 years ago and we were going to preach the gospel and sing and we we're going to have a service like this, there would be a full parking lot. People would be lined up the door to get in. Things have changed today, haven't they? And so we, we look around us and we see there's so much distraction today. But the fact is, people are still hungry for truth. And that truth can come through in the life of a Christian in a thousand different ways by how you live, what you exhibit in your life. You see, the inconsistent Christian life is condemning and luring thousands of souls to hell simply because people don't see the difference. It's causing people to have no confidence in the Bible and no confidence in uh, the preaching of God's Word or believing that the church has any answers to help them. You know, there's a preacher that one time stood up on a Sunday morning service and he said, I got to tell you, I know a man that's been living a double standard here in our church. In fact, he's been living a dirty and a, a, a horrible life running around with other men's wives. And unless he puts $50 in the offering plate this morning, tonight I'm going to call out his name. <laughs> He had 49 $50 bills go on the plate and one IOU. Um, <laughs> we don't know what's going on in around us today, but the fact of the matter, people are watching to see how you live. You see, friends, people are looking at you. They're looking at me. Whether uh, a young person's going to school, going to work uh, in the career that they have, or shopping, uh, whether they're out in the yard where they work in their home, They'll think things like, uh, so-and-so is a Baptist. I see him, he takes his Bible, he goes to church every Sunday. And, and I, I, I heard him talk about it one time. Uh, he says that he's a Christian. You see, our lives ought to be consistent with the teaching of the Word of God. If we're going to have an impact on this world, it's got to be real, and it's got to be right. The unspeakable that we're talking about is a gift from God, and God's gifts are good. God always gives good gifts. Our lives ought to show that gift. So we have to show it. Because it's unspeakable. We can't convey how good it is. We need to live it day in, day out, week after week, month after month. We need to practice it, what the Bible says, and how we live. And by the way, it would take a lot of stress out of our lives if we just rely upon the wisdom of God's Word. You know, there is a story told of a young man who got in trouble. I, 
he had made a mistake in his life, and he got into a uh, uh, situation with the police, and he was arrested. Uh, he was put into jail. He committed a crime that was worthy of death. And it happened in one of the very few states in the United States that still held capital punishment. He was sitting in the courtroom. The judge read the verdict and said, you're guilty. It was a small town, and most of the folks in the town that lived in that uh, particular community came out to see the proceedings of the court case and to see what the verdict was going to be for this young man. They, they turned up for the trial, waiting to hear the conviction. The boy had grown up there. Most of the people knew him. The courtroom was filled with people all from all over the county. The judge pronounced him guilty and sentenced him to die in the electric chair. The young man looked at the judge, starry-eyed and uh, kind of glassy eyes, and said, Judge, may I say a word? The judge said, you may. The boy stood and said, Judge, I did commit a crime, and I'm getting what I deserve. But Judge, when they pull the lever on that electric chair, there ought to be more than just one person in that electric chair. There ought to be more than one person facing the death penalty. I'll go to my death honorably. I'm going to pay the price for my crime. I know I'm guilty. But then he pointed to a lady in the front row. He said, my mother ought to go to the chair with me. And he pulled a Bible out of his pocket that a preacher in prison had given to him. And he said, mother, never one time in my entire life did you read this Bible to me. I love you, mother, but I'm going to the electric chair, and you ought to go with me. There's someone else that should go with me, he said. And he pointed to his dad, who was sitting in the same courtroom. He said, Dad, you ought to go too. You never took me to church. You never took me to Sunday school. You never told me about God. You never read the Bible to me. You never cared about me. Dad, you ought to go to that electric chair with me. Then he pointed to a, a man sitting in the back row with a saintly face and, and said, I'm going to the electric chair, Reverend, but you ought to be going there with me. Time and time again, I came to your church. And you never warned me of my sin. Time and time I went to your church and you never told me the consequence of my sin. And I sat in your service so many times, but you never ever warned me about sin. You may not like me this morning. <laughs> you may say, I preach too hard. Sometimes I do. Uh, you may say, I'm uh, you know, uh, too loud when I preach. And sometimes I may be. You may say, my preaching stings. And sometimes I'm sure it does. But you cannot say, I do not warn you about the consequences of sin. The consequences of sin are deadly. The consequences of sin, without getting saved, are eternally deadly. And the consequences of sin, if you are saved, it still carries a consequence. You pay the price. That young man looked at the preacher sitting at the back of the courtroom and said, I've been to your church. I heard you preach. Never one time did you warn me? Never one time did you tell me that I could be saved. Yes, I'm going to die, but you ought to die with me too, preacher. Then he pointed to the other side of the room, the little lady sitting there. He said, I'm going to die, but you ought to die too. I was in your Sunday school class. I was absent Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and not one time, not one time did you ever come to visit me. Not one time did you ever call to see if I was all right. You show no concern for me at all. Could I just suggest this? What this country of ours in Canada needs is a generation of old-fashioned churches and people that will walk out on a Sunday evening and, and, and whose lives show the joy that we are supposed to have as Christians. And our lives show the joy that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior with a joy knowing that we're going to go to heaven. We ought to walk and talk and live that all through the week. If our words can't portray it. If our, if our tongue can't come up with the words or the sound, then our lives ought to show it. Lives that show the unspeakable gift of salvation and joy that will take us to an unspeakable place called heaven. Go with me to Revelation 20 verse 11. Revelation chapter 20 verse 11.
And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, if that doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet, because salvation through Jesus Christ will allow you to go to heaven and not face that great white throne judgment. This is not for the Christian. That's not what it's talking about. It's for the unsaved. But how shall the unsaved know? How shall the unsaved ever have an opportunity to get saved? They'll see it how you live. They'll see it through your testimony. And yes, we do have to speak. And it's not hard. Every individual in this room, if you are saved this morning, you have a testimony. You say, oh, preacher, my testimony is not great. I mean, I, yes, it is. Every testimony is great. Because you're going to go to heaven because of what our Savior Jesus Christ did for you. And it's nothing you did. It's what Jesus Christ did for you. Question, how's your life this morning? Uh, what do your neighbor think? What do your family member think when they see you and your life and how you respond to difficulties, how you respond to death when it comes to the family, how it responds to maybe uh, disappointment, or maybe how do you respond when it seems like finances are growing uh, so stretched thin that you don't have the answer for everything, and people are watching to see how you react to those things? Are you still showing a life that's unspeakably full of joy? We ought to. This morning, the world cannot hear the sounds of an unspeakable salvation. It's just overwhelmingly good. Nor can my words describe the unspeakable joy that comes to the person who has their sins forgiven, the cleansing that takes place inside the life of a person that has been saved, and all of a sudden, the sin guilt is lifted off their shoulders. There's nothing that can describe it. No words, no sound can describe the unspeakable glories of heaven to come. We can't quite grasp it. We know it's wonderful. The Bible has given us a little uh, a picture of what it uh, would look like from human perspective, but we cannot grasp the joy, the unspeakable glories of being there where God is. So I'll dedicate myself through my life and actions and declare the unspeakable joy and riches of Jesus Christ, and I hope you will too, because there's a lost and dying world around us that need to hear of the incredible joy that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as Savior and the incredible relief by knowing our sins are forgiven by a supernatural Savior that has the ability to forgive sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, preacher, I tried, but I keep falling back into sin. Then keep getting up. <laughs> you might fall, yes. You might fall back into the old life, but get back up again. Don't stay there. You don't have to stay there. Get up and keep on going because today is another day. Tomorrow will be another one, and one after that. Determine for yourself you're going to live a life that is exemplatory, a life that portrays the new life that's inside you through the blessing of knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. I wonder. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I'm just getting by. <laughs> I live in a crazy, sin cursed world, and I've gotten down because it's overwhelming to me at times when I see the dev devastation of other countries, when I see what's happening in my own family, when I see what's happening around me in my workplace, my neighbors, and sometimes it gets overwhelmingly heavy. Can I say to you this morning, there's a God in heaven that will lift that burden from you. There's a God in heaven that will help you today if you'll just trust him. If you're saved today, he wants you to live for him. And he won't just throw you out to the dogs and expect you to do it on your own. He's there to help you every step of the way. He'll guide you, direct your thoughts, your actions, and your motives. But you've got to do it his way. Get up in the morning. Read the word of God. It's the cleansing soap that you need in your life. Your, your brain is like a huge funnel coming into it. And the things you allow to go into that funnel are the things that will affect your life throughout the day. I mean, you, you turn on worldly music first thing in the morning, what are you going to think about all day? But if you put God's word into that funnel and let it go into your uh, conscious mind, you know, they say that when information goes into your conscious mind, it, it, it works its way down into the subconscious mind. 
That's why it's necessary to read the Word of God in the morning because all through the day, that soap is working on you. It's helping you, guiding you, and directing you. God's Word is powerful. It is a living Word of God. And you need it if you want success. You need it if you want to be the kind of witness to those around you that we ought to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time we have this morning together. I am so grateful for North Country Baptist Church, our church family. What a joy it is to link arms and link forces and and go forward to serve you in the capacity that we have to serve you. And I pray that you'll continue to bless this congregation as we strive to live a life uh, that is pleasing to you, that others may see it and others might too want to be uh, uh, a partaker of that joy that we have by knowing Christ as Savior, that unspeakable gift of salvation. And then, Father, bring along the opportunity to speak for the things that we can do by sharing our testimony. Help us to have boldness when someone says, hey, I have a question. Give us a boldness to give the answer, and that answer being Jesus Christ. Father, we are so grateful for all that you've done for us. We can never uh, put an amount on it, a limit on it. We can never even comprehend how great a salvation it is, the cost of that salvation through Jesus Christ. We can't ever comprehend how wonderful that is, but we are so grateful today, and our hearts are overwhelmed that you could love us that much. Now I pray that you'll bless during these closing moments this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.